Thanks for inviting me. It's great to to uh, be here. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, my involvement with the Labour Party goes back to 1976. I joined it as a 19-year-old apprentice uh, bricklayer. I always felt had kind of uh, this romantic view of the Labour Party that it was always a force for good. That it was a uh, you know the best vehicle to deliver progressive change in the country. And I look back at some of the advances that have been made for the working class in Britain, and it has been delivered by by Labour uh, governments. Um, but, you know, I mean, you talked about my c career uh, coming to an abrupt halt. I, I never saw my role as a member of parliament as a career. And I used to always make that point very volubly when I was campaigning for greater democracy inside the Labour Party. And that was one of the reasons why I think I was uh, public enemy number one as far as the parliamentary Labour Party were concerned. Um because I said, when you start treating your role as a member of parliament as a career or a job, you start making decisions based upon your career, what's going to be good for your career. And that's why so many of them, well, all of them, in fact, not necessarily so many, all of them were unwilling to, to call out the, the Zionist lobby. Because the Zionist lobby in Britain is very powerful. The Labour Friends of Israel, a, a sort of pressure group within the parliamentary Labour uh, Party. Uh, when I was a member of parliament from 2010 to 15, around half the members of the PLP, Parliamentary Labour Party, were in Labour Friends of, of, of Israel. And uh, so it is a very, very powerful uh, lobby inside the Parliamentary Labour Party and in the country as a whole. And, and people were simply unwilling to, to speak out against that. But look, the Labour Party was established, you know, what, 124 years ago now, um, to try and be a voice for the working class in Britain. Um, up until that point in time, there'd always been a political duopoly in, in the country. It was the Liberals and the Conservatives, and the Liberals were seen as the kind of you know progressive force in, in Britain at that time. But in reality, they were really just another uh, puppet of the establishment. And, and basically, this is what the Labour Party is today, and maybe it has always been so. Um, but the Labour Party was founded, as I say, in 1900 to, to be that voice. So 24 years later, it formed the first Labour government. Um, it was a minority government. And uh, uh, the first Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Snowden, uh, talked about at that time the wild men of the left. Bear in mind, this was only a few years after the Russian Revolution. And talked about the wild men of the left inside the Labour Party who wanted the Labour government at the time to put through full throat to socialist policies. Um, but his main concern was to say we weren't going to do that. Because what he wanted to do was to demonstrate to the establishment of the day that the Labour government was a safe pair of hands, that the status quo would prevail under a Labour government. And then you fast forward to 1945, the government which is held up, and indeed I used to always hold it up, and it did do many great things. It set in train a post-war consensus that lasted for 30 I'm going to say 34 years, actually slightly less than that, actually. But um, if we get time, I'll talk about why I say it's slightly less than that. But, you know, it created the welfare state, the National Health Service built, uh, you know, uh, a million uh, homes uh, for uh, for working class uh, uh, families and so on. So it did do some great things, but it could have gone a lot further. But it was still very much an imperialist uh, government. And uh, and then you go forward a bit further to the 1960s and we saw the introduction of comprehensive education and so on and the Race Relations Act, et cetera, and so on. Um, equal pay was another thing that was brought in for, for men, and women, men and women by the Labour government. But in the end, you know, it was really, I think, crumbs from the table because we could have gone a lot further. And that post-war consensus that was set in train uh, for 34 years, uh, all of those advances that were made for the working class have all been stripped away. And... Uh, we're now in a situation where you know corporations hold even greater sway over the the uh, uh, political sphere than they've they've ever done, and and we've got a situation now where you know we are the uh, uh, sixth biggest economy in the world. There is really no excuse for anybody to be living in poverty in this country. I mean, when Jeremy Corbyn became the leader of the Labour Party, a lot of us were very excited. It became the biggest party in Western uh, Europe. And um, when I got re-elected, because I lost my seat in 2015, I was arguing, as a member of the Socialist Campaign Group, that we needed to go further than what we were suggesting in the 2017 manifesto, because you know it wasn't going far enough, in my opinion. And we could have been. I mean, what Jeremy was talking about was saying, look, we, you know, in the lifetime of, an, of a parliament, we'll eradicate street homelessness, which is a great and laudable aim. But by God, we should have been going considerably further than that. What we should have been saying is. By the end of a 
a, uh, a, a Labour government in office, a five-year, four or five-year parliamentary, we will eradicate poverty in this country. Now, that's not just a pipe dream. That is something that is doable. We are a very, as I've said, big and powerful economy. We issue our own currency. Britain can never run out of money. And this is where, you know, I talk about uh, that post-war consensus and uh, lasting for, you know, 34 years until 1979. But in reality, it was 1976 when things started to go wrong because Labour came into office in 1974. With, with, with a with a Well, yes, but before we, before we mm. went to the International Monetary Fund, Labour came in in 1974 with a commitment to bring about an irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power in favour of working people and their family. They had an alternative economic strategy that which they were implementing uh, that was changing Britain, the face of Britain. And then uh, Dennis Healy, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, decided that somehow Britain was running out of money. Well, impossible. We'd been off the Bretton Woods Agreement, which actually linked the pound sterling to the dollar, and the dollar was then linked to, to gold. Nixon jettisoned the uh, uh, the uh, Bretton Woods Agreement. So it'd been a floating fiat currency ever since that time. So we, you know, we, no way we could have run out of money. So he then went to the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund then insisted on austerity measures that must be imposed which he duly did. That led directly to what was been referred to as the so-called winter of discontent. Uh, but all those austerity measures were unnecessary. Thatcher then came in and obviously turbocharged the, uh, the neoliberal uh, monetarist agenda. But it wasn't Thatcher that started it. It was Dennis Healy and Jim Callaghan. So, you know, the Labour Party has always been a slave, it seems to me, to, to, you know, to the bankers, to the corporate sector, uh, to the establishment. And in many ways, you know, I think that 1945 Labour government was maybe fearful. And the reason why, you know, those reforms are put through was there was a fear in the mind of the establishment that after the Second World War, there was a real danger in their view of a revolution. And the chances of a successful revolution were very, very high then. Because my parents' generation, my dad, who'd served through that entire war, were being demobilized and they'd been used to military discipline. They all knew how to use weapons. And so a revolution in those circumstances, you know, had a very, very strong chance of success. And so there had to be some palliatives, it seems to me. And that's what was that's what was handed out. Things have gone considerably worse, of course. It, well, I wouldn't say they were bad then, but I mean, a lot of bad things in terms of particularly foreign policy. We could have gone further in terms of domestic policy, but in general, you know, things were moving in, in the right direction. I often give a little anecdote about when I was a young 19-year-old apprentice bricklayer, I was able to buy my own house, a brand new three-bedroom semi detached in a desirable village, which was three times what I earned as an apprentice bricklayer. That was the narrowest of the inequality in, in Britain had, had become. Because every year from that period until Healy went to the International Monetary Fund, uh, inequality uh, narrowed year on year. More and more of the nation's wealth was going into the pockets of ordinary working class people. And we knew as young people leaving school that we were destined to have a better standard of living than our parents did. But po Labour parties like, you know, jettisoned all that. When when Blair came to power in, uh, in 1997, he said his job was to build on Thatcher's achievements, not to tear them down. She didn't make any achievements. I mean, there was achievements in terms of in favour of the of the uh, of the ruling class, in, the in, corporate class, but not in terms of the working class. In fact, at one point, it was said that Margaret Thatcher's greatest achievement was she, Tony Blair. She said as that as the leader of the her Labour greatest Party. achievement when she was asked was was Tony Blair and New Labour because yeah. we made our enemies, you know, change their view, change their policy yeah. agenda in that sense. So, yeah, so that's where we are. And so now we're on. You're in a terrible place. I mean, you know, we had this hope when Corbyn was elected as leader of the Labour Party, but he was far too timid in the end. The entirety of the so-called socialist campaign, and I say so-called socialist campaign, because they ain't socialists. They don't know the meaning of the word solidarity. And even though John McDonnell, who was a shadow chancellor at the time, uh, used to end, he may still do this, end all of his speeches with by saying solidarity. But when it came to the crunch, he wasn't prepared to show any solidarity, and nor were any members of the socialist campaign group either. And I'm not saying to blow my own trumpet or say I'm anything special, because I'm not. I'm just a working class geezer from Derby, but I was the only one that was prepared to speak out against the Zionist lobby, to speak out for things, um, you know, like in terms of, like you mentioned about Venezuela and so on. These things are kind of just 
you know, common sense to, to me, but to speak up for people who are being traduced and thrown under the bus. People like Ken Livingston was being demonized as an anti-Semite. Ken Livingston, when he was leader of the Greater London Council in, in uh, the 80s, and when he went on to become uh, the mayor of London, but particularly when he was the uh, leader of the Greater London Council in the 1980s, before you were born, I think. But he earned the soubriquet as a loony lefty, partly for his stance on, on fighting racism. And I believe that Ken Livingston did more in public office than anybody to advance the cause of anti-racism. He was thrown out of the party, yeah. demonized as a bigot, and so many other people were as well. And I was the only MP, which shocked me to the core, I've got to say that, I was the only MP that was prepared to speak up for Ken, to speak up for people like Jackie Walker and Tony Greenstein and uh, Cyril Chilson, whose parents survived Auschwitz, who were all being demonized as anti-Semites. And it was clear that anti-Semitism was being weaponized in order to destroy the Corbyn project, to destroy the prospect of a socialist anti-imperialist government coming to power. But Jeremy lost the plot because he listened to idiots around him who said that he had to try and placate the, the Zionist lobby. And I kept saying to Jeremy, look, Jeremy, stop saying sorry. Every apology you make, every concession you give to the Zionist lobby is just feeding the beast and making it stronger. And ultimately, they're going to come for you and they're going to smash this project. You know, you didn't need to be a, you know, a kind of political expert, some sort of political soothsayer to be able to see that. It was plain common sense, plain as a pike staff. Why was I the only person speaking up for you know, people, activists, grassroots activists, and, 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 and you know, labor movement icons like Ken Livingston? You know, why was the only MP as well speaking out at the time for, for Julian Assange? It just didn't compute to me. And... Uh, and that's why I think, you know, the scales of his, it were fallen from my eyes with regard to the Labour Party. It's, it's lost now. I mean, our duty is to try to destroy the Labour Party and build something new, as difficult as that might be.